This is Stephen Kotler, and you're listening to Your Superior Self. This is Christina Rasmussen, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Dave Meltzer, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, I'm Anita Marjani, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Paul Selig, and this is Your Superior Self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is Your Superior Self. What is up, beautiful people? Welcome back. I'm Trey Downs, and this is Your Superior Self. Thank you guys for taking the time to hang out and download this episode. I'm very (laughs) nervous about releasing this episode because we talk about marriage with Laura Doyle today. She is the New York Times bestselling author of The Surrendered Wife, The Surrendered Single, and The Empowered Wife, and the star of the Amazon Prime series Empowered Wives. And her books have been translated into 19 different languages and published in 30 different countries. Over 15,000 women credit her for not only saving their relationships, but also showing them how to become desired, cherished, and adored for life. Oh, those are some pretty legitimate <laughs> um, credentials. And that's, I was a little intimidated by having Laura on the show. Well, one, because I don't, I'm very, this is a vulnerable episode for me, talking about marriage. Because I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I'm the best husband yet. I've been married for ten years, and I'm just now starting to be the husband that I want to be. I look at my wife, and I just want to grow with her, and like every aspect of our lives. I mean, we with every experience in life, I think that's where you get the love. I think that's you know they talk about love at first sight. Yeah, I think that's I think that is true. I think that is true, but I think that you know when. I'm, <laughs> Our story is just crazy, and you know, we met in Baltimore at a very young age, got married, had kids, and I mean, I've loved her my entire time that I've been with her, but the, the love gets deeper as you have experiences, as you have kids, as you go through life, as you as you tackle each problem, as you go through different problems, and you think that you've lost everything, and that you don't think you can ever get it back, and next thing you know, you guys are starting to come back and you're starting to win and you're starting to conquer things that you never thought you could conquer and you look and you turn and you see and you wonder like how did we do that and it's like those experiences not the mundane like paying of the bills but like the events in life that could break you apart that bring you stronger together and you just look and you think like this person chose to be with me. This person is choosing to stay. This person is choosing to conquer these issues with me. And I don't know of anyone else that would do that. And so like this episode for me is it's just very, very vulnerable. Because I, I'm still trying to be the best version of myself. Be the best, best husband that I can be. And having Laura on the show like really forces me to look at some er- aspects of my life. You know, me as a husband is one that I feel like I can always improve on, that I'm trying to improve, that continuously improve, because I want to. I want to be that best husband for my wife, because I love her and I want her to to be happy and I want her to um, grow as I grow. And then there's fatherhood that's just right there, and it's two different things in my opinion fatherhood and being a husband are two different things and I tend to be a better father sometimes than I am a husband but I'm learning I'm learning more how to communicate and how to um, how to speak to her to to motivate her to want to work on it as, as much as I do like she wants to work on everything right she wants to communicate all the time about her emotions and it's harder for me it's, I think it's harder for men to do that and so when I say motivate her, I motivate her by showing her results that she wants to see. And then so it, it encourages her to um, look at different ways to communicate with me, if that makes sense. Because all men are not, we don't communicate the same way as women. We talk about that in the interview where, you know, as a woman and, and as a man, there are different techniques that you can use to, to better communicate with them. And, you know, as we grow and as we, as we move through life together, 
it's like the simple things that I never really thought about that really make us stronger. It's the experiences um, of going for a walk and just communicating about about little things that kind of you know tear away from the mundane of, of life. You know, we just got back from Key West because um, we went down there for our 10 year anniversary, and it's like we traveled together for the first time without any kids, and it was an experience that grew us closer together not because we were in paradise but because like you know we didn't kill each other in the airport <laughs> you know like it's just like i was just so, re- so conscious of that i was like you know no matter what and maybe it's because of you know where i'm at in my life and, and how i'm trying to live more conscious in the moment and have more emotional intelligence but like you know she her and i we stress out about little things and we almost missed our, our, our flight. Like we were in the wrong terminal and like we realized at the last second. And it was like home alone, that scene when they're running through the airport. Like we were trying to get to the other gate. And we never we never really lost our cool because like we supported each other and we really, we've come a long, long way. Maybe if, if it was earlier in our, in our marriage, we probably would have been at each other's throats. But you know, where we're at today, like I can really, I, I really look and I see like our success as husband and wife. And we talk a lot about that in this interview. Like I said, this is very vulnerable for me because this is an area that I'm still getting better at. And I think that if I don't go outside of my comfort zone, it won't make me a better host or a better person. Uh, That's where we grow. That's where growth is. So I ask you to be kind uh, in your responses um, because, like I said, this is something that uh, I'm still working on. I think everyone's still working on this. But here's a little small clip about um, who Laura is, her book, and, and what's to come. Well, I think this is a good time to tell you the name of my first book, which I kind of artfully dodged (laughs) in the last question, which is, it was called, it is called uh, The Surrendered Wife. Mm. And uh, a lot of people heard that as obedient wife or subservient wife, but that's not it at all. You know, surrendering is just something we all have to do every day, right? You might be driving in traffic and it's heavy traffic. You wish it would move, but you can't make it move, but you could decide, okay, I'm going to use this time to talk on the phone, listen to an audio book or music I love, and you make the best of that time. So a surrendered wife just knows that she can't change anyone besides herself. So she doesn't try to tell her husband um, what to do at work or how to drive or you know, what to wear, what to eat. Instead, she focuses on her own happiness. I love all of that. And I hope that you guys do too. I hope that you guys took a lot out of this interview. I hope that, um, <clears throat> you guys um, gain more awareness about emotional intelligence. I hope that you guys, you know, in, in, this inspires you to go back to your marriages and uh, fully put in the work because trust me, it is, it is, there is a lot of work that needs to be done individually uh, to get the best collective effort. And that's with anything. It's not just marriage. It's with life. So yeah, I'm excited. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. Before we get into it, though, I want to talk about uh, my sacred activism, which is um, children suffering, family suffering, and um, you know, doing some something something about that, bringing more awareness about that. So go to abandonchildrensfund.org, donate, um, either your time or your money, but um, br- spread more awareness. Whether that's a share on Facebook or Instagram or something like that, just kind of bring more awareness about what they're doing. They're bringing in uh, abandoned children from underprivileged countries into their orphanages and and their schools, and they're educating them. They're giving them clothes. They're giving them food. They're giving them love, which is the most important thing that they can give them. And they're giving them a second chance at life that that most people don't get. And there's so many abandoned kids out there that uh, it's, it's astonishing. It's astonishing that there are so many big numbers of that. But if you think about it, war torn countries and, and countries that are experiencing famine and water shortages you know a lot of families and parents will take their children into the city and just pray that you know, if they drop them off at some of these organizations that they'll take care of them and provide for them because they can't you know think about that a parent of seven or eight nine kids um you know what do you choose you choose you know having keeping all of them all nine and then what if you can't feed them what if you can't give them water or, or what have you you know, and they get, take them into the city and they pray that if, if I drop off two, then I think the other rest, the rest of us can survive. And it's such a hard decision to make. I can't even ever imagine having to make that decision. But it's a decision that they're faced with and a reality that, you know, 
they have to make a decision like that and it just it breaks my heart that it that that exists but this organization brings them in and loves them and gives them food and shelter and, and education and, and you know nurses them back to health so <clears throat> like i said abandonedchildrensfund.org check them out donate if you can share it bring more awareness and then go to tradedowns.com leave me a message let me know your thoughts on this conversation I, i'm very interested um I, I like i said I'm very vulnerable here i'm putting it out there I, i'm very uncomfortable um but it's growth I, i'm seeking growth i want to get stronger and i want to be the best husband i can be and by having conversations like this that are tough i think i i, I can grow and it, as i grow my wife and i grow t- together so i'm very excited here we go let's get after it here is my conversation with the great and powerful Laura Doyle. This is Laura Doyle, and this is your superior self. I like it. Laura Doyle on the show, crushing it. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm excited for you to be here. I'm I'm a little intimidated because I'm, you know, let me just say this. So having an, an expert like you, on the show kind of makes me nervous because um, I, I want to make, I want to imagine myself as a good husband, as a good um, uh, I'm in a good relationship, but there's always like, you know, there's just always this kind of like, am I really the best husband? You know, am I the best person that I'm trying to be? And having you on here is like, you know, I get to ask you the, the questions that I might not be able to ask some of my other guests. So I'm very happy that you're on. Um, and when that, with that, can you kind of explain to people, you know, your background and, and what you're up to? Well, sure. So, um, you know, for me, this story starts with uh, ruining my own marriage, not being a good wife at all. So I bet you anything, you're a better husband than I was a wife when I first uh, got married. And in years seven, eight, and nine, uh, we were really struggling. In fact, uh, I really thought that I was going to probably get divorced. I remember thinking there's something wrong with my husband because he's not interested in spending any time with me. He um, would rather watch reruns than even making love to me. So I thought there's definitely something wrong with him. I dragged him to marriage counseling. And I thought, well, now the marriage counselor can fix him. And then I will finally be happy because that's how it works. Right. And it didn't work. In fact, I was, I remember I was sitting on the marriage counselor's couch and we'd been going for like a year and we'd spent like $9,000, which this was 20 years ago. So it was quite a bit of money. And, um, I remember just thinking like, I have to get divorced because he is never going to change and, or I'm going to spend the rest of my life in a loveless marriage. So I decided I would get divorced, but there was just one problem. I was too embarrassed to get divorced. I thought, you know, people came to the wedding just not that long ago. So as a last ditch effort, I decided to ask women, who seemed like they had happy marriages and they'd been married for what seemed like an eternity, which was 15 years. I wanted to know what their secrets were. And they said things that didn't even totally make sense to me, but I was desperate enough to just experiment. I'm going to try what they say. If it works, I'll keep it. If it doesn't, I'll just throw it out. And I remember we had either cold wars or wall to wall hostility at my house. So cold war was like, there was no talking for days. Um, or we just had these big blow up fights especially in the car. We had big fights all the time. And uh, I remember I started experimenting with some of their suggestions and I came through the door one day and my husband's face lit up. He was happy to see me again. I thought, okay, there's something's going on here. Something's happening. And I knew I was onto something. And then I uh, recruited uh, some girlfriends to do it with me so I could kind of stay motivated. It wasn't that hard to do the things they suggested, but it was new. It was definitely different than what I'd been doing. And I, uh, my parents are divorced. So I was following a failed recipe and there was no relationships one-on-one at my school. I don't know if there was at your school, probably not. Right. What's so that not one-on-one what? There was no relationships in one-on-one. Oh, one-on-one. No, definitely it's not. No. Definitely not. Right. So I didn't have any um, role models for what a, a, a good relationship should look like. Uh, so anyway, so I got these other women to do stuff with me and uh, it was crazy because we were just seeing miracles across the board. Like my husband was grabbing me at the waist and just pulling me in for a kiss because I was passing him in the hallway. So that was a big you know, change from what we'd been doing. 
And this, another woman said uh, her husband won the sales contest at work and he took them on the most romantic getaway of their lives. And another one said, well, this is going to seem trivial, but we've been arguing about him painting the family room for months. And today he got up and said, I'm going to paint the family room just to make you happy. So um, we knew we were onto something. And one of the women said, can you write all this down, what we're doing for my cousin in Florida? I said, sure. And that became uh, my first book, which um, Dateline did an investigative piece on it at the time. And it um, the next morning after that piece aired, it was number one on all of Amazon came a New York Times bestseller. It was published in 19 languages in 30 countries. And Jeez. now I know now there are thousands of women. Dateline didn't believe you that you had discovered this. And you're like, we're going to investigate. So. <laughs> no, no. I'm like, people are like, wait, was there a murder? You know, did you murder somebody? I'm like, no. She killed her husband. <laughs> they just wanted to talk to the crazy lady that was, because some of the things that um, they suggested are very counterintuitive and mm. maybe even fly in the face of, what a lot of society tells us uh, are parts of good relationships now. So you were, your marriage was struggling. You're nine, right? You're nine. Yeah. Um, you had cold wars, yeah. which is pretty crazy. Um, yeah. I, we have, yeah. we all have those, right? Right. Um, right. But what was it like? So you said you got with some, some female friends and you guys came up with some examples. Like what exactly? Give me an example of what you would sure. do. Sure. Well, I remember. I wasn't particularly open to the suggestions at the time because they, like I said, they just sounded so foreign. I remember one woman said, um, well, I try never to criticize my husband, no matter how much it seems like he deserves it. I was like, man, have you got anything else? And I'm not going to do that. So I didn't think I could do it. Like, I just didn't even think it was possible. Uh, and then another woman said, well, you know, for us, it was a big relief. Like I just when I get my paycheck, it goes into the joint account. And then he just takes care of all the bills from there. And that's really been great for us. It was big stress relief from me. And he really enjoys like, um, just kind of taking care of us that way. So it, it works out great. And I was like, yeah, that's, I'm like, well, educated. I'm a feminist. Like I know that like, you know, you're not supposed to give all your money to your husband. Right. But, oh my gosh, I did do that because they suggested, what have I got to lose? And, um, it was, it was actually great. Uh, so, um, one of my big complaints in my marriage was that, uh, I remember I kept saying to my husband, like, why don't you, um, try to get a better job or why don't you try to ask for a raise or, and of course what he was hearing was unbeknownst to me was you don't make enough money. And then I remember he quit his job and like, he wasn't making any money. And I was just seething with resentment about this because I thought I'm already doing everything. I'm doing all the housework and um, I was paying all the bills because I, I wanted to do, make sure they were done the right way, which is my way. And then I was complaining, uh, you know, about how much he was making. So when I actually came to him, I said, you know what, this is really stressful handling the money and I, I just can't do it anymore. And, um, you know, he was like, okay, I'll do it. And he took it over and it's been the best thing. That was like a long time ago. Now it was over 20 years ago now. And, uh, I mean, my husband, guys, was, he, he takes over the money. You just don't spend anything now, you know, <laughs> <laughs> quite the opposite. That's what I was thinking too. Like, this isn't going to work, you know, but he's more generous with me than I was with myself. Like I would go to a restaurant, we'd be out at a restaurant and I'd be thinking like, well, I want the salmon, but that's too much. So I think I'll just get the, you know, tacos or something. And he's more like, get what you want. You know, he wants to, he wants me to, be, well, cause in fact, I've asked thousands of men this question. I'm going to ask you too, since you're a husband, Trey. Mm -hmm. So how important is it to you that your wife is happy? Very important to me. Very important. Mm -hmm. Is there anything more important than that? Would you say? Mm, oh, well, the survival of my kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair, fair, yeah. So it's fun because I've asked thousands of men that question like, how important is it to you that your wife or girlfriend is happy? And they all say the same thing. They say it's very important or it's the most important thing or it's everything. In the UK, they say it's imperative. So it's really interesting because so many wives don't feel like that's important to their husbands. And I think it comes down to um, that, unfortunately, uh, like I know for me, I wasn't really trained on how to be a respectful wife. I was told to be a respectful wife, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what that meant. So I would, you know, I would say, yeah, like, yeah, I'm respectful, except for the way he drives and where, what he eats and then how he dresses. So, but otherwise I'm totally respectful. 
So that was a big missing. Yeah. I, don't tell anybody this, but I, I, I tell my wife, um, you know, when she's, when, I, when, when a man and every man on that listen that is listening to this can understand what I'm talking about. I call it chirping, right? Like, you know, it's like the, the kind of, uh, I, I don't want to say nagging, but it, I call it chirping. Like, you know, oh, you know, it's um, generous chirp, 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 chirp. Cause I, I'll hear, you know, you left the, the hose out on the, on the, on the lawn, you know, like it, you know, just little things. Right. And I'll just say chirp, chirp. And she hates it. And I can understand why she, it's, it's, it's bringing attention to something that I, that's bothering me that she's doing, you know, just unconsciously. Right. And so after I do that a couple of times and she's like, you know, that just, you know, it's, it's a, it's a fight starter. It's a cold war, like starter. It's like me launching that first missile over there. Just when I say things like that, what is your background? Like what, so you say you've, you've had no education one-on-one, right. But have you since then, since you've written your book, since you've collected all this data, have you done anything as far as specialize or, gotten a certification in anything? You know, it's interesting. Uh, so I was a journalism major. I have a bachelor's degree in journalism. And you think, what relevance does that have? But, you know, my first instinct when I was really stuck was to ask questions. Mm. And I know a lot of women take a, well, I think a, a lot of professionals take a, an academic approach, right? A theoretical approach. This is what the book says will work. Well, this was done in the trenches with real women, with real relationships. And there have now been over uh, 15,000 women who have uh, saved their relationship, fixed their relationships, made them worth being in again, right? Not just mm -hmm. like, okay, now we're, we're okay, you know, we have an okay marriage. No, now they feel desired and cherished and taken care of. And their husbands feel successful making those wives happy. They feel respected. They're not getting nagged. Uh, so everybody's happy. So I don't have uh, I don't have a PhD uh, or or even a master's degree or anything in the relationship uh, you know realm. Um, but what I have is this uh, experience of mine and now um, many thousands of students on our campus who uh, have had similar transformation from using I, I call them the six intimacy skills. Hmm. That's amazing. Um, you know it's funny I just. I listened to a lecture not too long ago from Helen Fisher. I don't know if you know her. Um, she worked, I think she works one with one of the online dating. I think it's like match.com or something like that. She's like one of the lead scientists over there for it. Um, <clears throat> there's just so many things I didn't understand about relationships before I listened to her. And I'm sure you can, you're, you're the same way, right? Like we just, there's like four categories of personalities and like, you know, one category is only attracted. There's just so many dynamics to the human being as far as of, of, you know, personality and characteristics and, you know, like background, right? Like things that are programmed when we're, when we're kids, my parents are divorced too. And it's like, and, and some, and my, my wife's parents are still together. And they're like the picture perfect, you know, married couple, but I, I didn't have that. I'm not, I'm not saying that I would change anything. I just think that people like myself and yourself who have divorce uh, parents, it's harder for us sometimes because it's like, you see this, whatever your experience is, it's kind of like, you know, it, it, I don't want to say it's almost like, all right, well, this has failed. I guess I'll have to jump out now and be like that. Or it's kind of like, I don't know. I think we have to try harder if that makes sense. Like we I know I have to try harder because I know, um, I know the repercussions of divorce, right? Like I know my, I, I have stepbrothers and sisters. Uh, oh, I did have stepbrothers and sisters, but they got divorced. And then uh, now I just have stepbrothers, but I know, uh, I don't want to say long-term effects. However, I'm happy right now as, you know, a stepson, I'm happy now having stepbrothers. However, I've seen, um, you know, just, the, the repercussions of divorce, you know, the toll it takes on a family, you know, mm -hmm. jealousy as a son, you know, seeing somebody, mm -hmm. you know, coming new, coming to the, into the home. Um, so mm -hmm. I feel like I have to try harder as a husband because I don't want that for myself. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And I'm so with you. I, I, you know, I'm on a mission to end world divorce because now that I know that I was suffering just because I it was never shown. No one taught me how to have a good relationship. So I just want every woman to get the information she needs to make her relationship playful and passionate again. And um, 
I, and I love what you say that we have to try harder because maybe what we were, what was, what was shown to us was, you know, you, you just, you struggle and then you call it off kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, and you're right that the repercussions are always pretty tragic. And, um, it sounds like you have a, a good relationship. So this is going to sound kind of strange, but you know, I give your wife all the credit. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> I'm sure you're a great guy and a great guy to be married to. And, um, and one of the things that I really discovered through this process was I had, um, kind of like Spider-Man, you know, a lot of power and with great power comes great responsibility. And I know it flies in the face of everything we're told about, um, you know, men and women are the same and equality and all that. And, and, uh, you know, for me, it just, that just hasn't turned out to be very valuable in my relationship. I, I actually, uh, love that I have special gifts as a woman that I bring to the world and certainly to my relationship and the world needs those gifts and, and my relationship needs those gifts and the and more... special gifts. I don't mean to cut you off. But like... Oh, sure. Well, like, um, I'll give you an example. So they did a study at the university of Toronto and I'm glad you're sitting down for this because they discovered that women are more emotional than men. <laughs> so there's some research money well spent, right? And you're, and you're only laughing and we all laugh. It's a, it's a joke because um, it seems pretty obvious, right? So women have, uh, I call it emotional brilliance. We're great at knowing how we feel and saying how we feel. And I just noticed when I was trying to get my husband to do the same thing, he's, he's not great at it. He doesn't even want to talk about it. I would say, how do you feel? And he'd say hungry or, you know, with my hands or something like that. And it was, it was, I was thinking, well, this is how we can be intimate. You know, I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to draw out your feelings. And he was like, no, I just, I'm not that interested. And the part where, that I was missing is like, I was the one who's in charge of that piece in our relationship. It's for me to come and say, like, I'm really, um, I'm really stressed out about that homeowners association, not approving our landscape plans or whatever. I'm, I don't know what to do, you know, and, and, and my husband gets off, you know, I can trigger his hero gene that way. And then he gets to step in and be my hero. And then I get to feel taken care of and he gets to feel proud and everybody's happy with that versus kind of the old way was like a, a superwoman syndrome, right. Where I was like, I was helping him. I was like, making his doctor's appointments and buying his underwear and, you know, making sure he ate the right foods or whatever. And in that uh, context, I really kind of squashed the intimacy because I reminded him of the last woman that did that for him, which is his mother. Right. And men are not sexually attracted to their mothers. Women are not sexually attracted to their sons. That's who they can start to remind us of if we, sure. if we get into that, that uh, perilous role. Well, don't ask Freud, because um, he, he might differ with that opinion. Um, yeah, he might. Uh, so I think he's part of how we got into all this trouble. So. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan. I so. know, right? Uh, the infamous train ride. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google that. Freud in the in the train ride. Um, so yeah, and, and and listening. It's so funny how our biology is so deeply rooted into our relationships. Like it, seriously, like Helen Fisher, and I think you would you would benefit so much from her work because like she was talking about how just genetically how we evolve, like how men listen. Um, like she was like referring some some of the science in it where, you know, the best way to talk to a man is not by standing in front of them because women like to do that it's it's genetic you know the way that women have have evolved it's like they want that face to face because it has to something it has to do something with the biology of you know having babies and children and being there in front of the in front of the child and where men we evolve you know i'm, I'm you know we we don't we don't like that face to face it's kind of like int intimidation or something where she she relates that we're best suited for like side to side. So if you come out, if you come back by a man and sit next to him, like, you know, if you see um, the picture of the New York skyscraper, where all the guys are on the lunch, how they're side by side. If you sit there and you come up to a guy like that and you sit there and, and talk to them, like that will be less threatening for them. They'll like kind of feel, I mean, I do it all the time. I, I, I communicate better with my wife on our stoop in our front, in our, you know, in the front mm -hmm. door because we're sitting side by side than I do if, if she's sitting in a chair in front of me, it's just weird how our genetics are, how we evolve. Yeah. And some of the signs can be so revealing. And that's why I really like reading relationship books because it's like, it brings to the forefront, like genetics or types of um, character 
uh, personalities that I never even thought about. Not because it's like, you know, you know, any like, you know, specialized to me, but us as a species, like some of the things that pop out because of the way that we evolved explains a lot. I don't know. I don't know. Do you get a lot of that data? Oh, well, I mean, yes, uh, yes. And no, I mean, I agree with everything you're saying about the side by side versus the face to face. And um, it kind of just reminds me like of an, another aspect of things that I was not in the know about early on, which was mm -hmm. the idea that in order to have a great marriage, I have to have a lot of girlfriends because my husband, you know, if I have a bad day, it could take like three best friends, two sisters, and my husband to kind of put me right about it because I like to hear myself talk. I've got a lot of words. In fact, there was another study that where they said that, um, and I don't remember the numbers, but it was something like women use like 50,000 words a day more than men. And so it's like, I just imagine like at six o'clock at night all around the world, like the men are like, I'm out, you know, I'm, I'm done with my words for the day. And she still has all these words left. So if you're not getting with a girlfriend and, and feeling heard and self-expressed that way, it's just an enormous amount of pressure on a mere more one mere mortal man to uh, support you. I get slack all the time, you know, like, you know, I'm on a podcast, I have a podcast, so I'm speaking on this all the time. And then it's like, well, you, you can have a podcast, but um, you know, <laughs> you're not talking to me. And it's like, uh, so I, I mean, it's just that, I don't know. Maybe you can explain a little bit more. What is, all right. So let me ask you this. What, like when you're working with women in particular, I'm interested to know this. Like, what is the number one, like, what is the common theme that pops up? Like, what is the common question? I mean, I think there's a couple really common ones. One is that, um, my husband, um, he's not affectionate. He's not attentive. He doesn't want to spend any time with me. That's a really common heartbreaking complaint. And she doesn't know why she doesn't from her point of view. Um, you know, he's just like uncaring and she's not aware. Um, like if she's anything like I was that she's actually really controlling and, um, that control, you know, where she's telling him, like my husband gives the example, he's dated a teacher before he met me third grade teacher. So she was with eight year olds all day. So she would say to him, go sit down, put that away. And, and like, she's still talking to eight-year-olds. It was really unattractive. He broke up with her. And so, and then he married me and I was equally <laughs> controlling. It just maybe it took longer to come out. I don't know. And um, at first, and um, you know, and I just remember like being in counseling about it and the, <laughs> the counselor, this is the one valuable thing I got out of marriage counseling. She's like, I don't know if you realize you're kind of controlling. And I was like, the record's like, rrr, rrr. you know, I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, we're here to fix him. What are you talking about? We're here about? to fix him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I kind of, I had buy-in from all the counselors. Like, yeah, you're the good spouse. You know, he's the loser pass. <laughs> like, cause I am a good talker and I talk more and anyway, and, and he, I think, um, anyway, so I, I kind of made a mess of things and, uh, and then it just, I remember saying to the counselor, like, okay, I am okay, fine. I'm controlling. And what, what do I do? How do I, you know, stop? And she's like, yeah, just stop being so controlling. And that was no help at all. And, uh, what I realized, um, after beginning this work is that when you stop controlling, what comes up is fear, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to tell somebody uh, how to drive or, or what to eat or what to do at work. If you're not afraid, if you're not afraid, you're going to have to wait longer or pay more or work harder or be lonely. You don't need to try to control. So I was just a very fearful person. And the act of relinquishing that inappropriate control of my husband, the practice, speaking of your superior self, right, was really mm -hmm. the act of becoming my best self, like choosing to trust the man that I chose, the man that I married. He was a smart guy. I just forgot for a while, you know, and then as I decided to focus on the evidence that I had, that he is smart and capable, he started to feel more respected and he became more trustworthy and confident. Uh, and then I had more evidence and that became a virtuous cycle. But I don't know that I would have ever walked through that door that was labeled self-examination, right? Become your best self. Uh, if I wasn't, if I didn't have my back against the wall, like I was either mm. going to get divorced and be humiliated, or I was going to really continue to suffer in my marriage. So I'll always be grateful for that breakdown that made me 
look at things a little differently. It's so much harder to stay married. Like, I, I, yeah. and I'm not, <laughs> and I'm just saying like, that is, that is the, that is my goal. That's what I want because I've seen, like I told you before, like I've seen the repercussions of, of divorce. I'm not saying that divorce is entirely out of the picture. In some cases it's needed. The one thing that I have noticed is that, and I've talked to my wife about this a lot, is that like, even like my internal uh, junk, like just keeps coming around, right? Like until you like deal with it and really work yeah. through it and be in it, um, it's just going to keep coming around no matter who you have with you, right? Like, so if I get divorced from my wife now, the same problems that I'm experiencing with her are going to show up in someone else. It's just, it's just because I'm not dealing with it, right? Like, I mean, I think that's the biggest, like that's, I know this sounds kind of weird, but that's like out of marriage. That's like one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is, you know, it's not going to be, the answer is not somebody else. It's not, Oh, uh, my wife and I fight all the time and then we're not happy. I need to go find someone else. It might be okay for, you know, if you get a divorce and now you're, you know, obviously going through a big upheaval of your life, but you find someone else and you might be cool for six months or so. And then next thing you know, some of the same characteristics, characteristics are popping back up and it's like you know things start happening that were very similar to your wife and it's like what is going on like you just see it it's like a big circle and unless you get in it filter it and like kind of you know take the time to work on yourself you're the same problems are going to keep popping up again and again and it's and it's your problems right like you think it you project it on somebody else because that's what we do like we people that it, that bother us we're actually projecting what bothers you know what's wrong with us onto them and we're not really focusing in on what it is and we just kind of we, we just hide it we just we just lock it down deep down inside of us and we never deal with it until you know something blows up and we're in a you know in a cold war um, and then the next, thing you know, that leads to the divorce. And then now we're looking for somebody else and the, the, the same, same scenarios keep popping up. Have you experienced that? Absolutely. In fact, um, you, well, you remind me of, uh, I think one of the, you know, some of the baggage that I arrived at my marriage with, but I didn't know it. Right. I just thought this is the way things are. Uh, I had a ton of, uh, fear around financial insecurity. And uh, so that thus, you know, trying to get my husband to make more money, I thought that that would fix me from this fear. And, uh, and of course, it had just the opposite effect. He heard me saying, you don't make enough money. He's not making any money. That's how powerful I am as a manifester, right? But it's not just me. It's all of us. What we focus on increases. And so I actually um, learned from Lee Miltier about, uh, I call it the spouse fulfilling prophecy, which was, so I was basically I had a spouse fulfilling prophecy for my husband, like you don't make enough money. And that's exactly what I experienced. So I decided at one point I would experiment with just changing it up. And I started uh, saying instead, uh, you've always been a good provider. And that felt like it was, you know, a little bit of a stretch, but reasonably like he'd had jobs and, you know, he'd been, you know, I was able to get it out, the words out of my mouth. And then just for fun, I started also calling him Mr. Moneybags. And uh, around that time, he started his own company. He'd never had his own business before. And it was very successful. It was more successful than he'd been at his other, his previous jobs. And it seemed very real to me that he was a great provider. And the Mr. Moneybags thing, I still say that to this day, like he'll get a big check in the mail. I'm like, oh, look, Mr. Moneybags, big check. You could take me to sushi later or something, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so I was able to completely change my experience by focusing on, you know, really finding evidence that he was a good provider. And, um, and that was like a bugaboo that I brought with me. Like there was no way my husband making more money was ever going to cure my fear of financial insecurity. Cause that was something I brought to the party, no matter what party I went to there, I was with that fear. So it was really, uh, like the wisdom of, not having an escape from your marriage. I feel like it, it, it is a great Petri dish for um, facing your own shortcomings and becoming I, your superior self. Yeah. No, superior selves, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I agree. It is about that. You do become your superior selves because as you look into, you know, I call it your spouse mirror in a way, right. You look into your wife's eyes or I look into my husband's eyes and the reaction I'm getting 
is really telling me something about myself, right? Like, how am I showing up? Oh my gosh, he's really irritated. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. I had a, we were at dinner uh, at a nice Saturday night. We're at this swanky restaurant that's just hopping, you know, and the waiters are flying by and the music's playing and everybody's, you know, talking and laughing. And we're having this nice conversation. And in the middle of it, I said something disrespectful. I said, I was questioning uh, his preferential treatment to one of his clients. And all of a sudden, my husband got this look on his face and the music stopped and all the chit chat stopped. Like the whole thing was just like ruined. And I was like, oh, and uh, I wasn't quite ready to be accountable yet. So I just said, oh, was, was that disrespectful what I just said? And he was like, yeah. And because now that I know how to be respectful, he's he's used to that and he'll call me on. <laughs> he will definitely uh, point it out when I'm not practicing what I preach. And so then uh, in the next moment, I just kind of, I got there and I was like, oh, I apologize for being disrespectful just now when I uh, criticized your, you know, which clients you give mm -hmm. treatment, that nice treatment to. And he, he was like, thank you. And then like the music came back and the waiters, you know, and the chat chat came like our good time was back instead of ruining the night, right? Instead of like having it be a tense conversation, like what? All I said was, right? And him going, you know, like you're, you're not trusting me. Like I know what I'm doing running my business or whatever. We could have had that, you know, that old talk. But really, I do trust my husband. He's a great businessman and there was just no need to go there. But, um, you know, seeing that reaction on his face, that was everything I needed to know about sure. uh, what was on my side of the street to clean up. On my side of the street. Um, <clears throat> that's so interesting. Um, the book, right? How long ago did that come out? Well, uh, so I've written, I've now written five books. So the first one uh, came out in uh, 2001. We're having the 20th anniversary mm -hmm. year, uh, celebrating 20 years of uh, empowering wives to be ridiculously happy without their husband's conscious effort. And uh, so that's a ridiculously happy celebration we're having. <laughs> and then my latest book is actually called The Empowered Wife, because that's uh, what I really got from um, learning these skills, right? These six intimacy skills from practicing them, from showing them to other women, which is kind of where the magic happens, right? If you want to learn something, teach it. Uh, I became a, a wife who felt empowered instead of feeling like the victim in my relationship, uh, I learned where those levers were uh, and that by, and it turns out they're very pleasant things to cultivate. They're nice characteristics that you'd want to have anyway. Like who doesn't want to be um, a, a respectful wife? I, 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 I did want to be that. Um, and so, you know, until I found out, you know, how accountable you had to be. And then I kind of resisted that for a while. And then, and then I got with the program and decided to bring that or, um, like being a goddess of fun and light is kind of one of the aspects of it, right? That's who my mm -hmm. husband fell in love with was I, I love to have a good time. That's, that's who he met and sure. what I was like at the time, uh, or a grateful wife. That's, you know, there's all these different, cult, uh, characteristics that you cultivate that you'd want to have anyway, confidence and dignity come out of it. Sure. <clears throat> do you ever get blowback? Like just listening, right? This do some women get upset when you said respectable wife, like a uh, uh, respectable wife. What are you trying to say that I have to submit to him? Like I have to, you know, do you ever get that? <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I think this is a good time to tell you the name of my first book, which I kind of artfully dodged <laughs> in the last question, which is, it was called, it is called, uh, the surrendered wife. Mm -hmm. And, uh, a lot of people heard that as obedient wife or subservient wife, but that's not it at all. You know, it's, a surrendering is just something we all have to do every day, right? You might be driving in traffic and it's heavy traffic. You wish it would move, but you can't make it move, but you could decide, okay, I'm going to use this time to talk on the phone, listen to an audio book or music I love. And you make the best of that time. So a surrendered wife just knows that she can't change anyone besides herself. So she doesn't try to tell her husband um, what to do at work or how to drive or you know, what to wear, what to eat. Instead, she focuses on her own happiness mm. and that in turn improves the intimacy. So I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of nuance, right? In relationships, like people will say, well, we're having this conflict. He thinks we should do that. And I disagree. And so I guess we have to compromise. Well, you know what? That never worked for us. I was like done with compromising in my marriage because 
and then nobody was happy. I remember uh, one couple, uh, he wanted uh, dark cabinets and she wanted light cabinets in the kitchen and they got gray cabinets was their compromise. And then neither of them liked them, right? So there's actually, um, you know, uh, a very powerful way to negotiate uh, between a husband and wife without ever having to compromise. We don't even do that anymore. It's been like 20 years since I've compromised or he's compromised and um, we still can you know, it's better. I feel like it's more powerful way to find, um, the, the resolution and, and, and to find the North star that we want to navigate by. Mm. Do you, do you regret titling in that <laughs> surrendered? You life? know what? Um, I mean, it's know, good. It's, a, it's good, right? Like, I, I mean, it, it's good. It's good. I, had a lot, I mean, I got you a can lot use it. You can use yeah. it for everything in your life, right? Like a surrender, like the surrendered life. I mean, it's just kind of like what That's you're right. just talking about, like That's surrendering right. yourself. It's like kind of like just. It's like not giving away to the ego. It's not really. It's it's not saying I, you know I'm not gonna put I'm not gonna invest my emotion into this right now. Like or you know what I mean? Like you're talking about traffic. You know, just kind of being like be the tra- be with the traffic. Be here. Just be here, present. Right. Like surrender to the yeah. moment. I think it's yeah. it, that's what it that that's what it means to me. And I could see how some people might be, uh, you know, triggered by the, you know, the surrendered wife, but to me, it makes sense, right? Like it makes sense. Uh, even as a husband, I can do that. Right. Like that's right. If my wife is, um, husband surrender all the time, right? Absolutely. There's your next book. The surrendered husband, (laughs) (laughs) the conscious conscious husband, the the smart husband. Right. That's right. It was definitely, uh, you know, a dividing line for people. But it was really interesting because uh, I think, I mean, I remember one journalist picking it up and she said, I picked it up to make fun of it. And then I opened the pages and I found these hidden mirrors for myself. And she said, I'm not laughing anymore. <laughs> so there was, um, is that, and it caused enough controversy at the time to, um, you know, we sold hundreds of thousands of copies of that book. It still is a good seller to this day, 20 years later. How, how did your life change after that? Yeah, it changed. It changed. Well, um, I think one big, thing that was different was, you know, when I was the armchair quarterback of my husband's life, you know, my life was kind of going by. It's like a car with nobody behind the wheel in a way, like no one was paying attention to it. Right. Cause all my energy was on him and what he should be doing. And I didn't really realize that, but once I got back onto my side of the street, you know, I got to write this book and it became a New York times bestseller. And then I started a, an international coaching organization and I got to do, I got to go on national TV, right? I was on good morning America and the view and dateline. And, and then I, I got to have my own show on Amazon prime and now I have a podcast. And so, and all of those things were terrifying. You know, each thing that I was doing was really scary. Uh, and I was afraid to do it. I was afraid to do any of it. And and that was why I wanted to be the armchair quarterback of my husband's life. So learning to not act in my fear was actually developing my courage muscles, mm. right? And courage is not the absence of fear. As Ambrose Redmoon said, it's the decision that something else is more important. So I became more courageous in my marriage. And then that made the rest of my life so much more interesting and exciting and purposeful. I got my mission to end world divorce, uh, mm. you know, grew into something. Um, so yeah. What was changed. the fear though? What was the fear? Like, oh, was well, acceptance? like the fear of going on national television, well, public like, speaking, right? Like public that. speaking, or that was another thing. People started inviting me to like, I got invited to speak at a mosque, right? Uh, I got invited to speak, uh, a, a, to a, a group of thousands of Mormon women, and I'm neither of those faiths. So uh, it was interesting. Like I, I, I had no experience as a public speaker. I hadn't done it. And so um, that was really terrifying. Or yeah, <laughs> I remember being on the phone with my sister like the day before I was supposed to start shooting that um, Amazon series, Amazon Prime series. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I just need a couple more months to get ready for this. So I think I just need to cancel and not, you know, like maybe I just have to prepare more. And I just was just, I was scared. <laughs> I want to sure. do it. So everything I mean, that you it's want. the number one fear, right? Like I think uh, public speaking is number one. Death is number two. So I mean, it's right up there, right? Or <laughs> well, even... how was it? Well, how was the prime? The prime episodes? Like what was it? Like a series? Was it like a documentary? Yeah. Like what was that? It's a it's a series. It's a, series. a demonstrating. You know, I just wanted people to see what. Um, because a lot of us have a therapy couples counseling background. We know what that is, right? And um, I'm not a, a huge. <laughs> 
I'm not a huge fan of couples counseling because, um, partly cause I struggled, but not just that I, now that I've helped so many thousands of women, um, uh, we hear it a lot, you know, uh, the, the counseling was the death knell. That was the nail in the coffin. So what's because, the difference between what you teach and counseling though? Right. So we wanted to demonstrate the coaching. That's what we did on the prime series. So, so with, um, with counseling, a lot of times, one of the first things you do is you go and you bring your husband, right? The two of you are there. He brings you whatever, however it works. Usually the wife is bringing the husband and, uh, you're going to tell this stranger everything that he's doing wrong. So can you think of anything more disrespectful than doing that? Right. It's pretty bad. You're digging your hole deeper to start off. And then um, the next thing that happens a lot of times, I, and they, I know that marriage counselors mean well, and they got into it for the right reasons. And they're on the same side as me. They want to end world divorce too. But a lot of times there's just a focus on all the things that are wrong. And because what you focus on increases, you know, you leave that session, you can leave it with all your hope drained out of you like the is it the dementors i think in the harry potter books and movies where like you just get near one and all your hope is sucked out of you and that can happen at marriage counseling uh and then i'd say that the the third thing is um like i just don't remember anybody actually holding me to be accountable for my side um when i was in marriage counseling uh and and so and and especially as the wife right as i consider myself, the keeper of the relationship. And, and this is what we see with wives over and over, you know, with a lot of my students, like we didn't know we had the power. Uh, but once we learn and we exercise it, you know, I have these cheat phrases we give people. Uh, so I have about 20 cheat phrases that are just meant to, they're meant to put your heart right. And sometimes I'll say them in the wrong tone. I've done it before. Like one of the things I started saying to my husband, cause I had kind of trained him like always check with me before you make a decision, like starting a business or buying a new cell phone or getting dressed, you know, you better kind of see what I have to say about it first. So you won't get in trouble later. Right. It's embarrassing to say now. And so to undo that unwitting training, I started uh, using this phrase, um, whatever you think. So he would say, um, you know, what, you know, what should I, what should I wear to the party or whatever? And I'd be like, yeah, whatever you think, you know, you you have great taste in clothes or whatever. You know, I just say whatever yeah. you think. And so I'm different. Or if he'd say like, I wonder if I should take the cars, you know, the brakes in now, or if I, you know, I think maybe wait till next week. And I'd be like, yeah, whatever you think. Right. The old me would be like, those are brakes. Like you can't mess around with brakes. Right. That's yeah, a yeah. safety issue or whatever. But the new me was like, you know what? I, mean, I trust him. He's smart. That's why I picked him. That's why I married him. Mm. And so whatever you I, think, I like that. So there's like 20 different phrases like that, that are just helpful to get you back mm. on track and you can say with the wrong tone like i've done it i'll be like whatever you think <laughs> no that's not that's not the right tone <clears throat> but at least i've got a default that's better than my old default which was just to jump in and like sure. let him know how much smarter i was than him mm. is there a difference in generations like is there a generational gap is there like difference as far as what you're seeing with um, I don't know, people that are married that are older than a certain, you know, millennials, you know, for example, is there yeah. like different, I, I guess, is there a different technique that you teach? Is it all the same? Is it one size fits all? I think there's this, this huge, um, like mythology about that, like the old fashioned ways and the new fashion ways. Cause well, I started learning about the intimacy skills when I was in my twenties and kind of, kind of a newlywed still. And I thought, oh my gosh, this stuff is so old fashioned. Like this is what, you know, I guess like our grandmas used to do or whatever. Mm -hmm. But honestly, if my grandmas did know about this stuff, I think they would have told me. I don't think they did. I think they, maybe they stayed married because it was socially and economically harder to get divorced. But um, I think, uh, I think there are some things about men and women, like I remember I would get these letters from, I got a letter from Egypt. And this woman wrote and she said, thank you. You know, you saved my marriage. And I, we thought only Egyptian men were like this. And then I would get letters from Japan and they would say, wow, we didn't realize that American men were this much like Japanese men <laughs> or whatever. It's like, you know, I think there might be some um, ancient truths, right? Some universal. There is similarities. We are there. one species, right? We're all the same, same yeah. guys, just different locations. Um, but right. yeah, I mean, I just think that, um, 
are you fine? Like, I feel like uh, I think she. Um, I think I did see some data too. Like people aren't getting married as much or, or as frequent anymore. <clears throat> I think like the marriage rates are actually really low. I think they're. Uh, I think it's, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I think people are living together longer as far as like um, before they get married. Uh, but I'm assuming they, you know, you don't have to be married to, to use these techniques. You can work in any relationship. Oh, that's exactly what about work right. relationships? What about like boss? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, the same I type use, of ideas. I, or what? Use what, I use them everywhere. I, I wouldn't. Whatever wanna... you think, boss. Whatever you think. <laughs> well, what I do, I use it like, let's say with a, a contractor, we're remodeling, right? And, um, you know, you pick the best person you can. And then I think it's really valuable to just reflect that trust, you know, that you're deferring to his expertise. And, and also, so one of the things that we teach uh, that was totally unknown to me was, is expressing your desires in a way that inspires. And so uh, there's a really embarrassing story about this where um, before we were married, my husband took me to Hawaii and I was so excited because I thought, okay, we're going to go to the beach and I would love to go to the beach. And um, so, but we got up the, the first day and I, I didn't say I wanted to go to the beach. I said, Hey, what do you want to do? Or what do you think we should do or whatever? And he goes, Oh, I think we should go see a volcano. I was like, well, a volcano, fine. And I, I, you know, it was like a new relationship and I just wanted to get along. So I thought I'll just suck it up. I'll go see a stupid volcano. And so we're, we're driving in the car and you don't see a volcano for a long time. You just see the molten rocks or whatever. And I started to fume. I, I'm getting upset about this. Like he didn't ask me what to do. Right. So he notices something's wrong. And he says, um, is, is everything okay? And I go, no, you didn't even ask me what I wanted to do and I wanted to go to the beach, but you didn't, you didn't even think, oh, no, we're going to see a stupid volcano. Well, I don't think this is fun at all. Do you think this is fun? I think it's stupid, right? So he saw a volcano mm -hmm. and I just feel sad for my younger self who had no concept of how to say what I wanted. And if you can't say what you want, you're never going to get what you want. So um, what I learned is this formula for expressing your desires in a way that inspires. If my husband knows that I want something and he thinks he can be successful in making me happy, the man is going to like bust himself to do it. And you as a husband, I bet you feel the same. You're like nodding a little bit, <laughs> like that's yeah. the same with you, right? Like yeah. she says. So what I learned to do was like, I used to say to him, John, this kitchen's a disaster. I thought he would jump off the couch and start cleaning it. That never happened. So, uh, but I learned to start saying, um, I, John, I would love a clean kitchen. And I remember I first said that like over 20 years ago and he said, okay, he goes, I'll clean it. And he did. And he's been doing it ever since hmm. for 20 years. I don't do the dishes anymore. He does them all. What if I said so, that about the grass? What if I said, I would love the grass to be cut. Would that work? Yeah. Yeah. You think that would work? You think <laughs> if she'd do you it? said it, if you said it to her, you're saying, yeah. I mean, is that I, I'm a, this is where I, I really see a big difference between men and women. And so for me, um, feminine desire is the seat of her power. Mm -hmm. And so it really isn't reversible. And this is, I think the big mythology that of kind of modern life, right? We have to sort of, or there's a little bit of pressure in the world to say like men and women are the same. Cause I think, I know for me, I was afraid to say there was a difference between men and women because I thought it meant I would lose out on opportunities in the work world. But um, now I don't see it that way. I, you know, um, I think it was Marilyn Monroe that said, um, women who seek equality with men lack ambition. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that in some ways um, we're in a wonderful position to, um, if we are able to receive, if we're able to show up um, I call it pleasable. I made that word up because I was trying to figure out like, there's this thing that um, wives yeah. aren't doing, right? If we've got that look on our face that like, okay, there's no making her happy, um, then our husbands will give up. But if they think they can succeed, they will keep trying. And that's something I absolutely love about men is they are just continuously willing to sacrifice and serve and, um, you know, just be the hero. Sure. They're willing to, to be the hero. Yeah. What about with kids? Like, um, what do you have any children? I don't. I don't no. have. I have five books and no children. <laughs> I have five books and no kids. The oldest is twenty. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> She's grown. <laughs> um, 
the, the what so does your techniques change with kids like oh. what is the what is the what is the x factor for for having kids and and having a having a very i would say re, you know respectable marriage i mean it's yeah. it's tough with when you throw kids in there so tough i think there's a like a big shift in the marriage of course it's just a huge game changer as you well know um to have uh, a wife who becomes a mother and gets that mama bear instinct in her, which is key to the survival of the species, but also can, um, can crush the intimacy in some ways. Right. Because she's like, I remember, uh, one husband was asking what I did and I said, Oh, I teach women how to stop nagging their husbands and, and still get what they want, you know? And he goes, yeah, he goes, I'm not even smart enough to wash the baby bottles. She's got to do everything. Oh, so I, I can't touch them. You can't, okay. can't touch you, you can't touch the baby bottles either. So, okay. So it's a common thing. Right. And it's, um, and then the, oh, it's just so painful on both sides really, because she's overwhelmed. She's exhausted. She's getting no self-care and feels like she's responsible for everything and he's not helping. And really, you know, you'd like to help if you thought you could make a dent, right. If you thought she was pleasable. Um, so, so that, yeah, it definitely comes into play, uh, these intimacy skills. Um, I remember, uh, I had one, uh, student who was the mom of young children, pretty young, I think three and five, I want to say. And one of the things she developed through practicing the intimacy skills was a two hour mama break in the middle of the day, every single day. And she taught her kids that they couldn't ask for a hug or a glass of water or anything else if they wanted a happy mama. And she just used that time to like nap or journal or, you know, whatever it was she needed to fill herself up so she could show up and be the kind of mom and the kind of wife uh, for her family that she wants to be. Yeah. I think it's very important. Like you, you have to have those times to fill up. Like you have to be the best version of yourself, whether that's going for a walk or a run or exercising or taking yeah. a nap. Like you don't need, I love naps. Like I never thought I'd say that. But I love me a good nap. Um, but it's investing in yourself. It's investing, putting money back into your, you know, the stock of Trey so that I can be the best husband or the best, best yeah. father that I can be. Right. Like it's, yeah. it's you know, you gotta be selfish. Sometimes you gotta fill that tank. Right. Self-care is not selfish, is it? It's mm -hmm. you wanting to be your best self. What a great way to look at it. It is an investment. It is an investment. Yeah. Laura yeah. Doyle in the house, crushing it. Um, what do you got going on? Is there anything that we need to know? Any new courses? How can people find you? I do have something really fun going on right now and it's free. It's, um, it's called the adored wife roadmap and, uh, you can, and it also has the three top mistakes that everybody seems to be making, trying to get their husband's time, attention, and affection. Uh, and you can download that for free at lauradoyle.org. Simple enough. Laura, what do you want your legacy to be? Um, well, you know, uh, I would love for every woman who is, uh, just kind of asking herself, why, why is this happening in my marriage? Why am I struggling? Why don't I feel loved to be able to get her hands on the information, the right recipes, right? Not the failed recipe that she might've witnessed, whether her parents were divorced or, or maybe they just didn't have the kind of marriage you'd want to emulate, um, I just want to get that into every woman's hands and all over the world. And we're making a dent, you know, I, I feel good that I've got about 40 coaches who um, are, are showing other women how to implement these skills, helping them see their blind spots and really figure this out so that the heartbreak is lessened, right? That there's less divorce, which I, I really equate with tragedy. I mean, it's hard on the kids. It's hard on the adults. It's hard on the community. Communities depend on strong families to be strong themselves. Uh, so yeah, it's my legacy to do everything I can to end world divorce. Beautiful. I love it. Laura Doyle, thank you so much for joining. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Trey. It's been a real pleasure.